Would a government ever hurt renters and make people homeless? The obvious answer is no. Politicians always have voters' interests at heart and would never do anything other than improve their well-being. To do otherwise would be an abdication of duty, not to mention political suicide. But things aren't always so simple. Let's consider the bedsit, which is short for bed sitting room, a sort of single room accommodation designed for one person, usually in a larger building that has been subdivided into multiple units, often involving shared bathrooms. In December 2008, Green Party Minister John Gormley introduced a ban on bedsits, which meant that all rental units were required to have private bathrooms. No longer will it be possible to have accommodation where there isn't proper sanitary services, where you don't have a shower uh, in the accommodation. The legislation was brought in at a time when Irish rents were falling, and the aim was to increase rental standards in a market where the accommodation was often dilapidated, poorly heated or unsanitary. A few years later, around 2015, a concept known as co-living began to gain popularity in Europe among young professionals and digital nomads. Co-living developments are similar to bedsits, but are of a slightly higher standard, as the units typically contain private bathrooms and kitchenettes, with larger kitchen facilities being shared. Bedsits and co-living became a political hot potato in Ireland around 2017, when then Housing Minister Owen Murphy spoke of repealing the bedsit ban due to its perceived impact on homelessness. This was met with opposition from the Green Party and Sinn Féin, with Eamon Ryan saying it would take standards back to before the 60s. Murphy was also criticised for describing co-living as exciting, which led Sinn Féin President Mary Lou Macdonald to describe it as an insult to those seeking a safe and secure roof over their head, while the Green Party's Kieran Cuff called for Murphy to resign over his comments. A very trendy kind of boutique hotel. Like and a prison. It seemed that co-living was definitely not the most popular idea in the room. In November 2020, Murphy's successor Dara O'Brien issued a new ban, this time on any future commercial co-living developments, citing concerns about the growth of the sector, which meant that both bedsits and co-living were now banned. When considering the minister's decision, one of the following scenarios is true. 1. The bans are a good idea, based on strong empirical evidence and sound economics. 2. The minister doesn't realise that the bans are a bad idea, or 3. The minister knows that the bans are a bad idea, but other parties are making hay by calling for them, so he proceeds with them anyway for popularity reasons. If scenario 1 is true, the minister is in a good position. But if either scenario 2 or 3 is the case, we are left with some uncomfortable follow-up questions. To get to the truth, it's necessary to go a little deeper. Since the bedsit ban came into force in 2013, the share of people aged 25 to 29 living with their parents has jumped from 37% to 68%. This compares to an EU average of 42%. Whether living with parents is better than a bedsit is debatable, but we do know that 94% of 25 to 29 year olds who are employed and living with their parents say they would rather be living somewhere else. And it seems plausible that many of their parents aren't thrilled about the situation either. The alternative to living alone is house sharing, which typically involves professionals living together with friends or strangers under loose tenancy agreements. According to census data, the number of private households being shared by unrelated people increased by 58% from 2011 to 2022, growing faster than all other major categories. 50% of house shares contained three or more people in 2022, up from 42% in 2011, and more than half of people living in shared accommodation say they don't have enough privacy. According to RTB data, about 63% of renters live in semi-Ds, terraced houses or detached houses, a further 9% live in houses converted to apartments, meaning only 27% of renters live in purpose-built rental accommodation. The lack of purpose-built rental accommodation leaves most renters competing for the exact same kind of home, which is often unsuitable for their stage of life and drives up the price of family homes. After all, four professionals renting a four-bed can pay much more for that home than a single family could. The most serious effect of the ban has been to remove a housing option for those with the least means to pay such as those who have fallen into addiction or have had to leave the family home. According to Focus Ireland, the number of homeless adults has more than tripled over the last decade. In 2014, former Labour Minister Joan Burton touted the idea of removing the ban after a homeless man died rough sleeping, while in 2017, Housing Minister Owen Murphy acknowledged that the bedsit ban was a mistake and contributed to rising homelessness, but his plans to repeal the ban never came to pass. In 2020, the Housing Department report itself did not explicitly recommend a ban on co-living. Rather, it outlined that a ban was one of four options, with the others relating to clarifications around the standards imposed on such developments. 
several of which were perfectly reasonable, such as clarifying appropriate locations or setting a maximum number of units that can share kitchens. Sensible solutions certainly seem to be available. The report also notes that the average floor area per person of all co-living schemes permitted was 27.1 square meters, which exceeds the minimum required in a conventional two-bedroom shared apartment. Not too shabby, it seems. Clearly, the co-living ban had little foundation in the findings of the Housing Department's report. But like bedsits, the effect in this case has been that people have wound up in lower standard accommodation than what co-living would have provided. Opponents of co-living point to high prices as justification for the ban. This misses the point of the ban's impact on supply. Even if some of this new supply consists of expensive apartments, people moving into these apartments will free up space elsewhere, not least in four-bedroom homes that are more suited to families. Loopholes have emerged, enabling companies to specialize in the conversion of period houses into relatively low standard studios. The best of these look almost identical to co-living, minus the many amenities, but have managed to escape the bans faced by their purpose-built lookalikes. Others can be a lot more grim than most people's experiences of bedsits or co-living in particular. For Paul O'Donoghue in The Times, Peter Dooley of the Dublin Renters' Union says the changes to Grove Park have driven out those on low incomes. I went to school in the area, and it was always an affordable place for people to live. It has changed dramatically, and landlords are getting 1,200, 1,300 quid for shoe boxes. Lower income earners can't afford to live there anymore. It's a tsunami in Grove Park. There are only a few older landlords left. There were house owners in Grove Park who mixed with long-term tenants, but this has got rid of the community. It has been destroyed. The great irony is that in the attempt to improve standards, renters ended up in even worse situations. From Carl Dieter in the same article, in defense of the people who wanted the beds it's gone, they didn't do it maliciously, but it has made landlords richer and hurt the people they were trying to protect. The original bedsit ban was introduced in a different time, on the back of a property market collapse when rents were falling, and the ban could have at least been defended as a nudge towards higher standards. But the defensibility of the ban declined over the ensuing decade as the housing stock lagged behind population growth. There is plenty of blame to go around, Fine Gael controlled the housing portfolio for all but two years, from 2011 to June 2020. The Green Party also shares culpability. First, they introduced the ban in 2008, and as evidence emerged that it was counterproductive, they made it harder for the government to repeal it, instead calling for the minister's resignation. As for the current minister, Dara O'Brien, who's been in place since 2020, it's hard to defend his continuance of the bedsit ban in the face of mounting evidence, less still his ban on co-living. Some of these bans were instituted during the pandemic, when the idea of people mingling together in shared spaces was considered abhorrent, so these bans may be a hangover from that time. But four years on, there's no getting around the fact that these bans have lowered the supply of purpose-built accommodation and pushed renters out of single occupancy into inferior alternatives. Most worryingly, the bans have kicked out the first rung of the housing ladder for many people. Wanting better alternatives for renters is all well and good, but better alternatives do not come into being by simply banning things. If a government bans second-hand Volkswagen Polos because they are too cheap or unsafe in a crash, it does not follow that people will have the means to upgrade to a Golf. Back to our scenarios. Given the record of these bans, Scenario 1 is increasingly hard to support, and only the Minister knows if Scenario 2 or 3 is closer to the truth. There are many solutions that do not require an outright ban. At a minimum, the rushed co-living ban should be lifted. The minister should consider some of the recommendations provided in his department's report about clarifying appropriate locations and setting a maximum on shared kitchens. Cheaper versions of co-living with fewer fancy facilities like cinemas should also be allowed to develop in the market. Banning things is the worst type of paternalism. It removes choice and amounts to the government telling people, you don't want that, you want a nicer place, and if you can't afford it, we think you'd be better off with your parents, or commuting from Port Leash, or emigrating. Ultimately, these bans are downstream of the root cause. We're not building enough homes. It's time for less banning and more building.